throughout the Catholic Church three days ago, Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the 40 days of Lent, and a little different from the experience I've had since I was a baby was for the first time, instead of having it rubbed across my forehead, uh, we sprinkled them on the crown of the head and began Lent. The symbol of ashes is completely opposite the deep, rich symbol the church uses called water. Uh, many times throughout the year, the priest is encouraged to replace the confidi or the I confess, the penitential rite, and the curialesum. He can move that outside. He takes the baptismal water and he'll walk around the church sprinkling them with baptismal or holy water while the choir sings an anthem. That's always done on Easter Sunday and Easter Vigil. I could do it every day of the year. You'd be very wet. Ashes or holy water? Big difference there because what they symbolize in the interior. We spoke on the ashes, our mortality on Ash Wednesday night. The church now has entered the first full week of Lent, and the season of Lent is for us. It's not something God needs for himself. It's a tool God uses to, to help us move away from what brings us to ashes, mortality, death, burial, and that's the physical side of evil. The invisible side is the moral corruption which began in Adam and Eve, who lost it all when they disobeyed God. Their bodies began to age and deteriorate. They returned back to the dust and earth from which they were made, and the corruption they created passed on to Cain, who killed Abel, and so on. So God looks at his creation, and a few days ago, just before Ash Wednesday, the Daily Mass picked up the reading just before the Noah one. You just got the Noah reading uh, this evening, in which God calls Noah a very holy man, and he sees what's going on now, uh, hundreds of years out of it, and we populate the earth. It's all coming unglued. And God says, I'm so angry. I wish I had never created anything. Can you imagine God saying, I made a big mistake. I'm going to just blast the whole thing. And he thinks again, says, well, I think I can repair the damage. So God invents what is now called the sacrament of baptism. Before the sin, there was only one sacrament. The sacrament of paradise is always matrimony. Think of paradise as the ultimate honeymoon between two attractive people, a young man and woman. That was the plan, a new life coming from their bodies. There is, but when sin came, God had to create a sacrament that would help stay with marriage, but anything, baptism. And so Noah's flood is always understood by the ancients as the beginning of what happens in a baptism. Now notice in the Noah event, the flood, the deluge, is rather global, like the pandemic, very global. He doesn't just baptize one person, whatever that is, he baptizes the whole world. And what does the water do? God uses physical elements to do salvation. It washes away the bad societies. Everyone who was evil drowned, and two of every creature and Noah's family are rescued on the ark, which is a prefigure of the church, buoyed on the waters of the flood for how long? 40 days and 40 nights. So in the Noah story, God invents Lent, and he prepares through baptism, which is the goal of Lent. Now, St. Peter has to weigh in as the first pope. He tries to tell us more deeply what baptism is, because everyone sitting here today, except for the few catechumens who are also watching on live stream, a catechumen is a man, woman, or an older child in school who is not baptized, wants to be baptized, and is training for it. And usually the night of nights, Easter night, is when that's done for them, the culmination of Lent. What's supposed to happen, St. Peter described in two sentences in the little epistle that was read for us tonight. He says, the, the flood of Noah is, is like baptism. It's the same thing, Peter says. Uh, one's global, one's individual, but it's not just washing away filth or dirt. Of course, in one sense, clean waters uh, in a river could wash away a dirty body's filth, but it's meant to show by external means the interior person is being washed clean. We've always taught that in grade school. When I was a kid in first grade in New York, Sister Mary Holy Water said, you're baptized, it washes away the stain of original sin. And Sister is correct. And Peter says Sister is correct. Except it's more than that. It's the pledge to God. And this is the whole point why we grown-ups are here. It's the pledge to, a pledge to God means a promise, a vow I make to God. 
of a clean and pure conscience. It means decision time. So the person who receives holy baptism, even as an infant, is making a vow to God as serious or more serious than the vow you made in married life or the vow I made to become a priest. So we're all equal here as baptized people. We said something to God long ago. And if I was an infant baby, my godparents made the promise for me with my mom and dad aiding them, and I was raised in that promise. There's no other way I can think of my life except from the day I was baptized that a decision was made for God, and I cannot walk away from it. I don't want to. And yet that's the problem with Lent. God says, well, I baptize people. You're not baptized a second time. The Catholic Church refuses to confer baptism even on our dear Protestant Christian friends if they have a valid baptism. Most do, some do not. We won't go into that. So baptism is so severe, whether you're a Catholic or Protestant, a pledge to God of a pure conscience, as Peter said. What's happened to that promise then? When John Paul II, now a saint, uh, was uh, his first year as a pope, he, he was young, he traveled extensively, he went to one of the most Catholic countries in the world. It should have been the most Catholic. Eldest daughter of the church was her title, a thousand, France, glorious France, sent so many missionaries here. Well, France in 1979, Notre Dame Cathedral nearly burnt down recently, no loss there because no one goes there except a few, few people. Why rebuild the thing, you kind of say? But, you know, centuries ago, it was packed. So John Paul preached out in an outdoor mass, said, France, you, eldest Catholic daughter of the church, and even the, the Protestant Huguenots in France, what has happened to your baptism? It was like it evaporated? Has that happened? You know, so if God says, I'm going to renew the face of the earth, I'm going to save society, in the future, it's going to take a long time. I will have to use the waters of baptism, not as magic, but to show a person they should be making a decision of a clear conscience to him in no other way and working at it. We don't repeat the baptism. So Jesus, the night he rose from the dead, the first order of business before he breaks the bread at Emmaus, the, the, which is the second time he does the Holy Eucharist, he creates, institutes a second sacrament that builds on baptism, which cannot be repeated. He creates penance. Whose sins you shall forgive are forgiven them. So what Jesus is doing, he's saying, once you're baptized, the water may dry off, but the pledge to God of a pure conscience has to continue, and we all fall off the wagon, don't we? So Lend is God's invention, his institution, to continue the work that began in baptism, so that on Easter night and Easter morning, the priest can walk around the church sloshing you with the holy waters of baptism, n not as a little trick, but to say, remember your baptism. Even if you were an infant, you made a decision, and God has not forgotten that decision. How is it working out for you? And therefore, in confession, to use St. Augustine's phrase, you're baptized every time through tears of repentance because your conscience, by which you make your confession, is a pledge to God, I meant my baptism, and I keep straying from it. It's a struggle. It's almost as if you fell off the ark during the great flood and deluge, and you spend your time treading water to keep from drowning, and sometimes that's the Christian life, treading for a long time until finally we overcome that hidden corruption of evil that keeps tempting us. And that's why the gospel was used today. It's the shortest version of the temptation by Satan. He tempted Adam and Eve, and he won. He tempted many others and won. Now this new human being who also says he's God, Jesus, if I can get him to fall to temptation, I've got the whole thing wrapped up. God cannot save the world. So Jesus will be tempted more than once, three times in the gospel, at this time in the desert, and then many times until he rises from the dead. Satan will not succeed with Jesus Christ. Some of the apostles will be tempted, and they will fall too. So God sees us, knows it. So every year, the 40 days of Lent are like the 40 days on Noah's Ark. That was a lockdown, let me tell you. Or the 40 days, uh, even though we come and go throughout our regular business, something should be happening in the interior way there. Notice how the gospel began today. St. Mark's account says, I like this, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the desert. I don't mean he had a Hummer or a four-wheel drive Jeep and drove him in. He pushed him from the Jordan River, the crowds, into isolation. 
the opposite of, of, a, of a lockdown in your home, isolation away from people for 40 days to fast, to pray, to kind of size himself up, and to become vulnerable to the temptations. And that's when Satan comes to him to tempt him. And he succeeds. Now he ends the gospel, it's only three lines long, with the famous phrase, we used Ash Wednesday night here. He starts his mission saying, folks, I'm here. We're going to have to reform society. No more floods. God said to Noah, I'll never use water again to wash out society. But Jesus says, I've come. Repent. Believe in the good news. Good news meaning that I am the means of your salvation. I will call you to be baptized someday, by which you will make a pledge to my Father of a pure and clean conscience to live a new kind of life away from Adam and Eve. And in the sacrament called confession or penance or reconciliation, uh, we will always renew that pledge in baptism over and over again until the life of Christ is perfected in us. And when that is perfected, it will include our frail mortal bodies that were once bound to turn to ash and are destined now for the bodily resurrection and salvation. So Lent is a season that's very personal. We're not going to rebaptize people at all. And when we do baptize, it's always one at a time, not a huge flood that's global. God wants things to change. And we're here tonight because just like Jesus, I believe you and I'm here, in some way the Holy Spirit has driven us here as it drove us so many here on Ash Wednesday, and many taking the risks, we're still wearing masks, social distancing is there too, but God drives us into these things, and he wants to soften us up for his will, so that the things he prompts us to do, we will gladly do with a cheerful heart, that his work of grace and life will transform us into a new creation.